Hitchcock would have loved to do, I think, a movie which has the explicitness that Basic Instinct had. It's an absolutely great, rip-roaring story with a fantastic main character. A modern version of an evil woman. I just felt it was one of those special movies that comes along once in a while. And it is very original, it's very daring. I think that will hold up for many, many years to come. You would not get away with as much in today's cinema. We needed a vehicle to make our case about Hollywood homophobia. Basic Instinct was ideally situated to be that vehicle. I just heard about this uh, fantastic script that Joe Esterhaus had written. I didn't know Joe Esterhaus. I didn't know what he had done, really. Ultimately, I found out that he had done uh, Jagged Edge. He was one of those writers at that period of time that people were very interested in. When you read the screenplays, they kept your attention. He wrote it on spec. It was a first draft. It was typed to relieve. There's a lot of mistakes by Joe. And by purpose, he does that, so it looks very rough. And suddenly, the script was on the market, and everybody was uh, trying to get it. And the price went up and up. And Mario then, at a certain moment, realizing, which of course other people had realized too, that this was a script that was ready to go. This was not a script that needed three, uh, six months of development. We can start immediately. And Mario outbid everybody by saying, OK, $3 million, which was a sensation at that time. He went first to Michael, and he basically made a contract with Michael before he got to me. Mario, of course, being European, Italian, Lebanese, uh, knew all my European work. The Force Man, for example, which is, let's say, a prequel, you could say, to Basic Instinct. You know, Basic Instinct is nearly an Americanization of the Force Man without occult levels. The female killer in The Force Man is more a Black Widow kind of type. She is more an occult killer. She might have influenced reality by black magic if you want to. While here we have a straight killer. I want to shoot what's on the page. There is no negotiations about nudity. It will be exactly, basically what's there. You, you will be nude for three, four pages. No blankets, no this, no protection, no nothingness. Of course, the choices became limited. And then the process of the looking didn't lead to much, really, because all the people that I asked to accept my conditions, of course, backed off because they didn't feel comfortable. You know I don't wear any underwear, don't you, Nick? And one of the people that came in, of course, was Sharon Stone. What are you, a pro? No, I'm an amateur. She was Catherine Tamel from the moment she started to talk. It was like amazing. And I showed the tape to Mario, and, 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 and I showed the tape to, to Michael Douglas. After three months, four months of testing, I had driven Michael crazy because every time that I had new people that came in, it was never as good as Sharon. Finally, after three, four months, Michael said, okay, let me do a test for Sharon. And Michael was completely won over when he saw it and when he worked with her, he had a very good connection with her. It was immediately clear that she could do it. And then after the test, he said, uh, well, you know, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it with her. I mean, it was not only working with her, basically, that had no name. And it was also all doing all these sex scenes, basically, that by then I had all drawn out very precisely. And when I gave it to, to them after the, the contract was signed, they said, well, this is what we're going to do. It was the script. But then, of course, you see it, basically, with everything. Let's say when you see the angles that we used, isn't it? That it was not like shooting here, isn't it? If, if you would sh it was always shooting here, basically, or shooting there. Clearly, it was a really uh, 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 for them a hard confrontation. Even even then, with the storyboards, and I had said to Sharon, "You have to accept that you do everything I want. Whatever I want, you have to do it." She said, "Okay." <laughs> she didn't have much to lose, really. <laughs> it was a sort of role that was meant for Sharon Stone. It just happened to be exactly right for her at that moment in time in her life, and how she was being perceived by the world at that point in time and uh, and I think she grabbed it and hung on to it and made it what it is.
Do you have a cigarette? I don't smoke. Yes, you do. Catherine is a woman who is as strong in any way as a man and whose sexuality is as free and unfettered as a man. I'm not going to confess all my secrets, Nick, just because I have an orgasm. She comes from a tradition of film noir heroines and villains. I don't make any rules, Nick. I go with the flow. She's beautiful, she's feminine, and yet she's also completely and totally masculine. She's a superheroine in the way that, say, Sherlock Holmes and these characters are superhuman in their cleverness. Hi. Am I disturbing you? No, come on in. That was extremely contrived, but worked very well. And that I thought, okay, how can I make that true to myself? I say, okay, she's the devil. That basically makes her supernatural in some way. She could foresee with more insight than anybody else. And I'm Detective Curran, this is Detective Moran. We're with the San Francisco Police. I know who you are. To be so clairvoyant, to be so, let's say, clever in planning. And it works. Did I scare you? How much did she pay you? There is a lot of darkness in Michael Douglas' character. And Michael Douglas, also his whole persona and charisma, has that. It's fun to play darker parts. Uh, it's fun to play parts that have a, an edge to them that allow you uh, not to have to worry about likability or if they like the character. Michael is a man who has a mystery, a danger, something dark and evil, perhaps even to a certain degree. <laughs> Of course, Gene Triplehorn again is guilty too, in some way. What am I supposed to say? Hey guys, I'm not gay, but I did fuck your suspect. For a long time, there is the suspicion that she is the killer in it. And at the end, the police think she is, but we know better, probably. I was really delighted, especially when I started to realize how wonderful and what a beautiful city San Francisco was. And of course, realizing at the same time that I was shooting in the city of Vertigo. And Vertigo being one of my with North by Northwest, probably my most favorite Hitchcock movies that I studied forever and still study. Um, I, I, I knew Vertigo by hand, you know. So a lot of things that Hitchcock had done in Vertigo, you will see back in Basic Instinct, clearly. All changed a little bit, you know, and I didn't go back to the movie to check it out. I, what I remembered of Vertigo, I applied, you know. And if Hitchcock would take the Golden Gate Bridge, I would take the next bridge. I don't think Basic Instinct is about anything. I think it's a, it's a really good story. It's a creation, a very beautifully crafted, lapidary creation of the cinema, full of brilliant concepts and a great character at the center of it. Did you really think it was so special? Some of the lighting that I use in it, that are, it is like very playful. Like for instance, it's in a car sequence, very first time she gets picked up for interrogation. I really wanted to make sure that at the key moment of the scene, that I wanted a specific light to hit her to enhance the drama. He falls for the wrong woman. And in reality, it would never happen, of course. Like, right on cue, this heavy-duty backlight, sun, and, and that puts her in, in a kind of, gives her the kind of a, this halo character around her, and makes her also, for the first time, really visible in the movie. The interrogation scene, no room would be ever lit like that. I mean, every interrogation woman at police, Thing would be incredibly boring, some fluorescence on the ceiling and that's it. I had very colorful lighting, fluorescent on the floor with special colors and, and really stacked them so it almost became like a Mondrian painting and in the same way the light that came from the ceiling that was very seductive almost. See so really beautifully focused and like sitting on this proscenium, this stage, while the guys, the interrogators, are in the dark but they have this kind of shadowy prison-like on them. It looked like the roles are reversed. They are in prison and sees the one who's controlling them. In the script, of course, it was clear when she changed his clothes. She said, can I take, put on something different? The dynamics of the scene, of course, were that she would be so, let's say, impressive to these people and exude so much sexuality, be so free in her choice of words, that she was in control. Whatever they attack her, whatever angle they ask, she, she has such a blunt answer about everything. What are you going to do? Charge me with smoking? She's so upfront about her interest in sex, what kind of sex, how to do sex, what way, that it, she blows them away anyhow. So she's in full control. Have you ever fucked on cocaine, Nick? I felt that something else was suggested by the fact that she was nude. It was acknowledged in the script. It was not written into the script, that scene. It's nice. So I thought about 
A st uh, something that happened to me when I was a student in Leiden, the university, we had a woman in our circles that was not a student, she was the wife of a journalist, so she was a bit more in artistic circles. And she always would come to parties and then she would do these things, that she wouldn't have any underwear. And my friend said, you see that? And she said, Jesus, it's horrible, she should know that, you know, because every weekend can see it. So he walks up to her and he says, do you know basically that when you cross your legs, you can see right really inside? And she said, yeah, of course I know, that, that's the reason I do it. Are you an idiot? It's nice. I remember they had big, big discussions in the editing room, where is what you were seeing were her ties or it was her vagina. Depending if you're female or male, basically the male said it's her ties and all the females said, no, you're out of your mind, you're looking right into her. Uh, honestly, it was, it, was, it was her thigh. Uh, at least I didn't see it and I, and I looked. <laughs> that probably is one of the most famous shots in any movie of all time. Basic Instinct is sort of legend now with Paul and me because, as I've said before in, 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 in public and in writing and many times it's probably the most difficult score that I've ever written. It was that difficult because Paul made it so. It, it's one of the best things I've ever written and I give Paul credit for it all the way along. The music of Jerry is phenomenal. I mean, I think the, that's one of these movies where music and film are not, cannot be separated anymore from each other. Paul is always looking for something that's not on the screen, which is what music's about. Not, you know, music is not about what's on the screen, but what the audience is not seeing, but what the audience should be feeling. Well, I had written the ending of the music, uh, uh, music for the picture, which I thought went very well. Paul was very happy with it, except for the last 20 seconds. Of it. And the camera pans over and you see the ice pick under the bed. I built to that and made a big statement musically on the reveal of that. And Paul comes over and he, and he hears this is, well, it's all good except for the ending. So what's wrong, Paul? So I think we should play the tragedy. So I wrote it, and I said, you know, Paul, actually, I like this a lot better than what I wrote before, thanks. He was very happy with it. Later, when they were dubbing the picture, I get this phone call. The big stage, and this boy said, well, guess what? I said, I bet. I bet you went with the first one. He said, that's right. He said, that's right. We played them both. And then we took a vote on the stage, and everybody wanted to go with the first one. So where's this going? Hmm? Everyone has their opinion about the end. I'm not sure anymore she did it. To this day, I'm not even certain if she, she was really the killer. I still don't even know if she's the murderer. <laughs> you know what I mean? The last movement, the movement in bed with the ice pick, is the final revelation. And the way that it's done, in Hitchcockian fashion, by simply focusing on it, is the language of cinema telling you this is the answer to the story. It was quite an argument, you know, quite a fight to, to keep it that way. But I, I think that it's actually um, the best possible ending. San Francisco Police Department, I'd like to speak to Ms. Catherine Trammell, please. We were doing our preparation in San Francisco. We had chosen locations and we were told that uh, gay and lesbian societies up there had got hold of the script. The most important thing that we saw in the script was once again um, the same character sort of reanimated, the homicidal, evil lesbian. And then it featured, as the protagonist, the main character, a bisexual woman who killed men with an ice pick. It continued a long line of lesbian psychotics in film. Their interpretation and our interpretation of the script was totally different. It was a wonderful vector for making very clear our political Needs. They really felt, perhaps because of some other movies, that this was the excellent target. This was a high-profile movie with a high-profile actor, shot in their own city. They said, this script is completely anti-gay. First of all, they said, why don't you look at The Force Man, which is about a homosexual. They said, we have no time to look at your movies. I said, but that's a movie that you can see how it treats homosexuality, as I do it in Spetters, as I do it in, the flesh, in flesh and Blood. I said, why don't you look at that? You know, then you know what kind of man I am. I'm coming from Europe. Homosexuality is not a problem in Europe, at least not in my country. 
being from Holland, there's such a liberal attitude for all of this that we were shocked about this reaction. It's like, wait a second, what is going on here? We never said it wasn't right to be gay. We, didn't, we, we felt we made it, it was, you know, she was bisexual and she had a great time. Who are you? I'm Roxy. I'm her friend. One particular flashpoint for me was the character of Roxy. Catherine's girlfriend. For one thing, she winds up dead, which was the typical story yet again. The real lesbian in the film is gonna wind up dead, the bisexual's gonna wind up with the men. Here you had another film in which queer sexuality and violence were deeply linked. They were coming to what they knew was a town with a reputation for having an open gay community to use as the backdrop and the color for this film. And we tried to diffuse the situation by having a meeting. All the representatives and the, and the representative of the city council and anybody that basically had anything to do with gay or, or something like that was there on the table. We offered effectively a critique of the film and asked them to incorporate changes on things that we found particularly offensive. They had many faults with the dialogue. If you don't leave her alone, I'll kill you. Anything that they interpreted as being anti-gay or anti-lesbian, they felt that we should change the dialogue. Let me ask you something, Rocky. Man to man. I was embarrassed. It was the only time I've been with a woman. They wanted me to change the characters completely. They wanted to give to, to change the parts, that basically uh, that the man should be the killer and the woman should be the detective. And then when we started to present these things, they challenged almost every one of our points. I had said in the meeting, the issue is basically that being gay is not an issue. The movie is, is pro-gay from the very beginning because being gay is an accepted fact. It's like biological. It's there and who cares, you know? Making it to a non-issue is the ultimate sign of being adult about it. It is not an issue. It's a, a part of life. We went back to the original screenplay that Mario had purchased from Joe and uh, we shot that particular screenplay. And action. We did not want to be censors, but we wanted to act. We knew that this was a piece of commerce as much it was a work of art, in fact, probably more so, and that unless we affected them economically, there was no way our, our message was gonna be heard. So that, of course, meant going to the set. Hollywood, you sit There was an enormous amount of publicity, anti-publicity, and hate and anger by the different gay communities that were in San Francisco. By our first night of shooting, we were demonstrated on by about 150 people. And this went on for 18 nights. They knew our location, they knew exactly where we were going, where we would be. Every day there was chanting and screaming and trying to get on the set. My lawyers had gone to a judge and we had a 300 feet restraining order against the groups. I also had about a hundred policemen. I thought it was great. I thought it was nice war, you know, and like they say, soldier of war, it's like the main character says that, Rutger Hauer, a little bit of war, not so bad. <laughs> So I thought, ah, this is life, you know, I'm making, I'm on the barricades, I'm making a movie that should be there, but they don't know. They were very clever, they rang bells, blew whistles, they got passing motorists to honk their horns by holding up signs. If you're a 49ers fan, honk your horn, and of course, being San Francisco, everybody's a 49ers fan. I had to arrest people only when they encroached on the barriers. The police rounded up, uh, I think, 40 of them or 30 of them. And they said, well, we can't arrest them because they're not really doing anything uh, to break uh, the law. But you, who have the restraining orders, you're the person who instigated this, so you have to arrest them. And then one by one, we were sort of brought before Mr. Marshall. He pointed to us and would say, yes, I want this person arrested. The first night that I got involved in arresting, I think I arrested 26. They really hated me. And most of their venom, certainly all of their nasty songs, were uh, related to me. We had a sense of humor about what we were doing. And we saw the absurdity of what was going on. And this just added to that. You know, if they wanted to take it to that level, then we were just going to take it up another level. And then they started to go for us. And they started to cut the cables when we were shooting. They were using, let's say, um, um, 
lamps to shoot in the camera basically so you couldn't make use the shot because there would be lamps of course shining right into the camera and it took quite a few weeks before it finally settled down and it created for very much tension on the set it created tension between the, the, the actors because they were made to believe almost by the protest that they were doing something really wrong and dirty and that they were kind of embarrassed about it michael was really made to believe that he was doing the wrong thing And Rolling Stone calls it one charged up erotic thriller. Freeze! Basic Instinct, rated R. This film was going to be released, and regardless of what we had done, it was going to come out in essentially the form in which it had been written. Um, it was still just as offensive to us, and it was going to have a multi million dollar publicity machine behind it. So we decided that we were going to ride that machine to get our message across. How do you feel about the protests? Not, not just the ones in the past, but the ones that are planned uh, when your film opens in big cities. Yeah, well, I, I don't know. What, what can you do about it? I think they have the right to protest, and um, like we had the right to make the movie, I think they're aiming at the wrong target. Throughout the entire protests, we had been labeled as censors. We had been told that we were trying to censor this film, that we were trying to stop expression. And we thought about that, and we realized what better way to sort of turn that around but to name our group Catherine did it. Catherine, of course, is the killer in the film. By giving away the ending of the film, we were challenging Hollywood to, to see, well, which is more important to you? Is our freedom of expression any less valuable than the freedom of expression of the filmmakers? You can know that Rosebud is a sleigh and still think that Citizen Kane is a great film. If giving away the ending of this movie takes away its value, that's really not our fault. I felt that they were all absolutely wrong and that the movie would prove them wrong. When I look back 10 years from now and I see Ellen, I see Will and Grace, I honestly don't believe that would have happened if not for the fact that there was an active movement, a vocal activist movement out in the streets demanding that Hollywood change its tune. The moment the movie opened, it dispelled itself in in a day. It was the biggest success of the year, in fact, with the most I mean the most commercial movie of the year. And people thought it was audacious, of course. Some some people, of course, probably thought it was too much of, of, of the sex. But a lot of people, of course, thought audacious and, and money. What, what else better can you have here in Hollywood, isn't it? Paul got his typical reviews, which is that uh, it was excessive. We knew that there would be some, some let's say, people that would felt that we would have gone beyond the borders of, 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 uh, of what is considered conservative Puritan uh, uh, America, isn't it? and that would be probably be angered by the movie and a lot of reviews were angered you know and they expressed their anger in in in, in very mean ways in, in a lot of the reviews but um but i think they were all shocked it opened all the roads for me that i closed immediately down the <laughs> show girls i show girls could change my career more <laughs> also joe Estras. thank you very much joe it won't sell <laughs> why not somebody has to die I think it's a great movie. I mean, it's, it's just a nonsense movie too, isn't it? I mean, a woman killing people at orgasm, basically just for fun to see if she gets away with it, is a kind of an idiotic premise. In that direction, the movie is a bit strange, and of course, it's not realistic. But most thrillers are not. But from a point of view of achievement, of work, of artistry or professionalism, I think it's it's extremely nice movie. Writer Catherine Trammell is everything a man could desire. She's brilliant, beautiful, and wealthy. Do we have a time of death? For Detective Nick Curran, she is also dangerous. We got 31 stab wounds. What was it? Ice pick. And possibly deadly. 867 Capital. You know how she does the boyfriend? Then ice pick. His investigation draws him into Catherine's dark world. A place where he will find exquisite pleasure or death. Hey, here we go. Shot on location in San Francisco, Basic Instinct was directed by Paul Verhoeven. Well, now she goes forward again. Wow. 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 Yeah. Who also brought audiences the science fiction thrillers Robocop and Total Recall. Yeah. Okay, let's go. Speak to Miss Catherine Jamel, please. Michael Douglas and Sharon Stone star as the cop and the suspect. What's your new book about? 
A detective. He falls for the wrong woman. What happens? She kills him. Whose attraction for each other takes them on an erotic exploration that will prove to be one of this year's most controversial films. Mm, He's a cop who has gone through some bad times and has done some things that we that you might consider wrong and is on is now at the point that he wants to do okay with his life and tries to get better so how are things i'm working my ass off i'm off the sauce i even stopped smoking how's not smoking it sucks <laughs> and unfortunately meets this extremely dangerous woman writing the book gives you an alibi Yes, it does, doesn't it? That brings him again to the more shadowy sides of his life. Do you like a cigarette, Lou? Don't you know each other? She sort of personifies in certain male images sort of the ultimate woman. You seem to know an awful lot about me. You know an awful lot about me. I don't know anything that's not police business. You know I don't wear any underwear. Don't you, Nick? I think that he sees in her the kind of challenge and game that he used to have to do in dealing with the bad guys who were doing narcotics. I was expecting you. It makes it that much more interesting that your opponent is attractive as she is and as intelligent and sexy. You won't learn anything I don't want you to know. Yes, I will. And I'll nail you. I must seduce him with my mind. I must seduce him with my sexuality. I have to weave this, this, this web that he cannot pull himself out of. He'll just fall in love with me. I'm in love with you already. But I'll nail you anyway. She has an unbelievable fascination with him. You can put that in your book. I think they both looked into the dark side. And like it there. And way back. Her soul is so dark and so damaged, it's very difficult to find someone to play with. So when they find their playmate, it's a really big, big thing. It's like the world has opened up and they're not alone, finally. The more he works on the case, the more he is starting to believe that what he thought was guilty is not guilty and what he thought was not guilty is guilty. There's got to be somebody in Berkeley who knows what the hell happened. I know what happened, all right? Catherine told me, and everything she says is checked out. You got goddamn Tweety oh. birds flooding around your head. That's what you got. Oh, man! Evil is very difficult to distinguish. In the presence of evil, we're all lost. <laughs> I think Michael has been extremely courageous to, to do this movie. He puts himself on the line. Mm. Sexuality is an important factor. I think mostly because I think a lot of motivations are sexual. You weren't making love to me. No, who's I making love to? You weren't making love. As truth and reality become casualties of his investigation, Nick's relationship with Beth, a police psychologist played by Jean Triplehorn, also falls prey to Catherine's influence. Something's going on. You're sleeping with her, aren't you? I can see her effect on this person and see her profound effect immediately. She seduces people. Her claws are reaching through Nick. She manipulates people. She is evil. She knows where I live and breathe. She's coming after me, Gus. I felt it was a movie about evil. <laughs> I think that there is an element of violence in all of us. She want to play, fine. Everybody she plays with dies. It's a love story. She is screwing with her head, Nick. A tale about what happens when you dally in the darkness a little too much. I give you too close to the flame. <laughs> people that are bad are attractive. And I think because people know in their heart, they all party evil. It's only with some elements of hell mixed into paradise that you make some interesting things. Is that because we are bored by paradise? Somebody has to die. Why? Somebody has to die.
from the Young Mister.